Saat farkından merhabalar. Her hafta farklı ülkelerden, farklı milletlerden konuklarla bölgesel ve küresel gelişmelere dair farklı perspektiflere yer vermeye çalışıyoruz. Bu hafta Finlandiya'dan bir konuğum var. Dünya ekonomisine dair düzenli olarak öngörüler ve analizler yayınlayan Helsinki Merkezli Danışmanlık Şirketi GNS Economics'in CEO'su ve baş ekonomisti. Aynı zamanda Helsinki Üniversitesi'nde de öğretim üyesi Doktor Thomas Malinen. Bizlerle bugün biraz Avrupa ekonomisini, enerji krizini, enflasyonu, resesyon endişelerini konuşacağız kendisiyle. Doktor Malinen, uh, hi, welcome to my show. Thank you very much for joining us. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you very much. Uh, well, uh, Dr. Melanin, I would like to start with, of course, uh, there are so many issues to talk, uh, but we have very limited time. So high energy prices, high inflation, factories closing down, winter is coming. So the situation in Europe is quite worrying for all of us. And the biggest fear uh, recently is recession. Uh, all signs show that Europe is entering a recession. So how soon, how devastating, and how long do you expect? Let's start with this. Well, actually, I don't think we are going to go into a recession. I think we're heading into a depression, which is a, a much steeper uh, era of economic decline or economic calamity, actually. And they, uh, well, it's, it's really, there are so many variables currently affecting the, the path of, of the depression. But I'm thinking that it will last probably three to four years in total, and it will start in a matter of months. So by the, the winter, the, by, by the end of this year, you are uh, expecting. Yes, we it start. It will start with a recession, and then mm -hmm. it will deepen seriously during the uh, first first part of, of next year. That's our current prediction. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Melon, is it already too late to avoid a total economic collapse? Uh, there is still a way to avoid, or uh, you are just basically expecting a miracle? Uh, no. Well, I don't think we we can avoid more in Europe, but the, the economic collapse, there, there's one big driver in it, and it, it's, the, it's basically the Russian gas flow. So it, this, is, this is an unpopular opinion, but if we want to avoid the economic collapse, we basically would need to get the Russian gas flowing back to Europe. Mm -hmm. That's the only way. So because we don't have the, even if we would somehow uh, be able to kind of uh, uh, get the more LNG or to, get, to fill the gap that the Russian po possible likely shut off, shut off of gas deliveries to Europe will leave with LNG. We don't still have the, we, regardless, we don't have the capacity, the mm -hmm. terminal capacity to really to bring it to Europe. And, and, the, and the even even bigger problem probably is the fact that we don't have enough electricity producing capacity currently mm -hmm. in Europe. Yeah. So, so I just read a, uh, a lengthy tweet from an uh, energy specialist who's basically stating that miracle we will see rolling blackout, blackouts in Europe. And the thing is that we have already seen like the aluminium smelters in Europe to close down or cut their production really hard because of the energy costs. Mm -hmm. And the electricity prices, all the prices, they will just keep going up when the winter gets here. And it will push, you know, really push companies and households to a, a difficult position. But in, that, in, that, in addition to that, we have also a very high inflation, which is not coming down yeah. quickly, even, even, uh, with the, even in the ECP projections. And then we have fast rising interest rates. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a triple whammy for households and corporations. So I don't see any other kind of outcome of this than, than a depression, unless we get the gas flowing from, from Russia to Europe. I see, uh, which is uh, quite like a miracle, I guess, uh, Dr. Melanin. Uh, I, I will come to that energy topic later, but I, since now you mm -hmm. touched upon also inflation, it's a huge problem uh, globally, of course, and it's at record highs uh, across Europe. And uh, as you also said, it's likely to accelerate in the coming months. Where is the peak uh, for the inflation? Uh, is the worst yet to come, do you think? Worst, worst is definitely yet to come. I, I hope the peak, that we see peak somewhere next spring, the first, let's say the first half of, of next year. I hope that the inflation peak is there somewhere. But we are not there yet because we have to factor in all the, like the energy price increases during the winter within the next, like, let's say, 
four to five months. And after that, we can, we can start expecting a, a peak in inflation. And the thing is that inflation crisis, they always, they, they have like two components always. First one is that you have a massive printing, let's say, or the kind of creation of, of uh, new money from the central bank. And then you have some shock. Mm-hmm. Get an inflation crisis, which is which is fed by the the vast amounts of money in, cir- in in circulation in the economy, and this is now what we have seen. So, if we if you look, for example, that the, um, the the balance sheet of the four largest um, oh no the increase in the money M2 money aggregate, which is basically just the uh, deposit and savings accounts, it's now somewhere near 100 percent of GDP of the world. So we have massive amount of money, you know, sloshing around in the economy. In this, in addition to all these costs coming from the war and from the sanctions, is driving inflation. So we need to get that under control before inflation will get down. How do you see ECB's performance, uh, Dr. Mullen? Because, uh, you know, uh, European Central Bank recently uh, announced the largest rate hike in its history uh, to battle uh, Mm -hmm. record inflation. Do you expect more aggressive uh, steps will follow? And does it really help or uh, make things uh, even worse? Well, it depends. Well, uh, from what angle you look, how uh, of getting it worse. But if you look at the tone, for example, the, uh, the, the head, of, uh, head of ECP, Christine Lagarde, and there has been an almost complete turnaround within the summer months. So now she's really hawkish, pointing to the fact that we need to get inflation under control. Other ECP members who speak publicly also kind of... Uh, I'm expecting a, a expedited... Uh, a rate hike cycle from the ECP, and we would, our interest rates could easily rise to something like four to five percent during the next two years. And the thing is that usually when you have, the, the, when the inflation is cre- when the, when there's an inflation crisis created by the money printing and and very like low, or let's say ease monetary policies of the central bank, you need to increase you need to tighten the monetary policy to get it back under control and because central banks waited way too long they should have started this rate hiking cycle a year ago Mm. because they waited way too long they have to go much further to get you really get the uh, like the uh, inflation expectations anchored again which if you look at for example the the uh, weight demands of the of German um, industrial um, unions, they are really high in the range of 8%. So inflation expe- expectations or the wage expectations are already running really high and the ECB must act decisively to get them under control. Mm-hmm. And that means expedited rate hikes. And it will lead uh, uh, worsening of the economic situation and, and in the worst case even the, the, the breakup of the eurozone. But this is mm. what you get if you if you let inflation run amok. You central banks should have never let uh, allowed this to happen. I see. Uh, you said a, a total collapse uh, of eurozone, Dr. Mellon, and I would like to talk more about this. Uh, do you really expect a total collapse of eurozone? Uh, I also want to add this uh, this question as a follow-up question. Because, you know, euro has fallen below parity against the dollar uh, for the first time in uh, 20 years. So where do you see euro's value over the uh, coming months? Uh, a weaker euro is here to stay, do you think? And also uh, an answer to, to, to the question of uh, a total collapse of eurozone, are you expecting? It's, is it a great risk? Is, is it such a great uh, possibility, do you think? Well... First of all, I, I think the weak, weak euro is here now for a while at least, because it is, of course, the ECB is now hiking rates, but it's way past or way below the levels of the Federal Reserve. And always when there is a uh, like bigger uh, uh, uncertainty in the world, you know, investors are all flock to the safety of the US dollar, and that's happening also now. But the Eurozone and Europe, is not the, really the problem solved here. So uh, it's just the thing is that 
the systems, let's say, uh, the, or the institutions that would hold a currency union intact in a case of a major crisis are not here. We have not created such things yet. And, and the thing is that the ECB is now buying massive amounts of Italian debt from the, uh, the funds they get from the matured uh, uh, debt of, of Germany and Netherlands. So they are kind of selling German and Netherlands bonds and buying the Italian ones. And if they would not do this, I'm betting that the uh, Italian bond yields would be uh, much higher. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the government of Italy cannot, could, could not finance herself, and then the options you know, get really limited of you stay in the Eurozone or get out of the Eurozone and start to print your own currency. Mm -hmm. And we will, I'm rather certain that we will face this question once again in the Eurozone, in the, let's say, within the next year or max two. Mm -hmm. So we have to either create a really massive transfer union to transfer, you know, uh, uh, money from the from the north to the south, basically, or then risk that the eurozone will simply collapse. And I'm starting to think that we should probably let the euro go. It it, it has been a failed currency project, you know, and there there are many reasons for that. I see. Uh, but uh -huh. uh, yeah. Please go ahead, Dr. Malin. No, no. The thing is that they. Uh, you cannot, history tells us that you cannot have st uh, sustainable or stable currency unions without a political union. And that's a fact. And now we would need to create it in a very difficult environment, the political union, that is. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we can get that done. So, you know, it's, it, it, it will be, for the Eurozone, it will be make it or break it years, basically. And I'm not certain that the costs that's uh, keeping the euro would bring upon, for example, for Finland, or should, such that we should stay in the euro. It's basically, many economists here think that if Italy leaves the euro, Finland should be next. And that would be the, lead the unraveling of the eurozone, basically. I see. So are you expecting, I, I mean, are you discussing, like, how, how are the local discussions there? We don't, we don't talk, well, at the current time, we don't really talk about the euro, we, call, we talk about the energy mm -hmm, yeah. and the prices of elect yeah, yeah. electricity. Uh, Dr. Melanon, by the way, I mean, uh, can Europe really endure uh, winter without Russian gas supply? How are the preparations? Because each country now uh, is planning to shield its own economy from uh, price shocks. Uh, there mm -hmm. are some plans for mandatory electricity savings, convincing people to cut back on heating their homes tightening mm -hmm. rules for public buildings, etc. So do you think these uh, measures are, will be enough? Uh, what are the plans for Europe for this uh, coming winter? And at this point, I, I would like to ask your also opinion. What is needed? Do you think a collective, a joint uh, action or individual uh, actions to tackle energy crisis? What kind of a winter is waiting for you? Yeah, well, I, I just read an article from Italy which basically stated that Italy cannot survive without Russian gas in any case. With, uh, with any, any, any amount of saving, any of that, it, it will, it, northern Italy especially will freeze without Russian gas. We don't know what, what will happen in Germany and, and France and all those. Uh, but the question is that no one actually knows because there is, the, well, there is like two big unknowns here. What will, uh, what will President Putin do and what will Western leaders do? Are they gonna, when the, it, it gets really tough during the winter, will they try to get a no negotiated deal, deal on Ukraine and all the, on the sanctions and all that or not? We just don't know. But what I think here uh, is that it has come Europe once again the point that we either sink together or swim separately. I have today, I have made it public and, and also talked with few, a few of our, our politicians that we should, North, North Pool is the common electricity market in, in Nordic countries. The North Pool should be cut off from the European electricity market. If we would do that, we would be completely self-sufficient in energy and all the extra we, you know, 
we produce, we could sell to Europe. But it's no point, it's no point for Finland and the Nordic countries to sink with the rest of the Europe because we have done a, well, not say good, but a decent job of covering our energy needs. I see. Uh, Dr. Melanin, we have a very limited time left, and I, uh, since you are uh, based in Finland, I also want to ask you this uh, NATO membership issue. Sweden and Finland uh, decided you know, uh, to join NATO in May, and setting aside their long-standing stance of military non-alignment, uh, so it was a major shift uh, of security arrangements for the two countries after Russia launched its uh, war on Ukraine. Uh, I really wondered, I mean, the membership bid is backed by the majority of the population, I guess, but also it has some uh, critics. Uh, do you see Finland's uh, accession to NATO as a mistake or, uh, or not? What will be the long-term implications uh, on economy also? Uh, I want to get your analysis on this, uh, lastly. Yeah, I, I think, I, I think it's, it was a strategic mistake for Finland because in, in, from what I, how, how I see it, Russia wasn't really a threat to us militarily. Uh, but and, and now now it's now we kind of get into unknown waters. We don't know how Russia will react, how well you know all the business relations, trade relations go from here. So that's a big big question mark now. And uh, um, yeah, we we didn't really talk about it enough, I think here about the NATO membership. But now we're going there and we'll see what it brings. So. But basically, you see as it as a strategic mistake. Yes, because now we now we if there is a conflict between NATO and Russia, now we are involved in it. Like before, we were not, as we were independent countries. So, I think in that case, it's a it was a mistake for a strategic mistake for Finland. Yes. So you don't feel more secure, uh, but more threatened is instead then. Yeah, personally, I, I feel more threatened now hmm. than previously. I see. Well, uh, Dr. Melanin, there are lots of other issues to talk, but unfortunately, uh, time is up. Uh, thank you very much for your time uh, and to uh, tell us your perspective uh, from Finland. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Evet, saat farkında bu hafta Finlandiya'dan bir ekonomist ağırladık. Doktor Thomas Malinen, kendisi GNS Economics isimli makroekonomik danışmanlık şirketinin CEO'su ve baş ekonomisti. Aynı zamanda Helsinki Üniversitesi'nde de öğretim üyesi. Biraz Avrupa ekonomisini, enerji krizini, resesyon endişelerini konuştuk. Aynı zamanda Finlandiya'nın NATO üyeliğini de konuşmaya çalıştık. Önümüzdeki hafta yine farklı bir konuyla, farklı bir konukla karşınızda olmak dileğiyle. Hoşçakalın. <gülüyor>